Good morning. Well, we can meet outdoors today. It is so nice. Um, this morning, with the time that I have, I want to get to your minds, not your hearts. Christianity starts with the mind, not with the heart, folks. If it gets to your heart, it's always supposed to go through your mind, or you usually get off into heresy and poor doctrine and all. Uh, all truths about Christianity starts with the mind. So I want to appeal to your mind. If I get to your hearts, I want to do it the biblical way, through your minds. Some of the, let me get this, how do you worship God without an iPad? I don't know. <laughs> That's not a joke. I'm sure God has a whole stack of them. The background of what I'm sharing here is in growing up, my father was a town alcoholic. I never knew him sober until I was 20 years old, from 6 to 13 years of age. For seven years, every single week, I was homosexually raped in my own home, and my parents wouldn't stop it. So the time I hit the university, I was bitter, I was hurt, I was wounded, and I was mad. And when I met these Christian professors and students, they just simply ticked me off by the way they lived. And uh, so I asked them one day, this one young lady, boy, was she cute. I used to think all Christians were ugly. <laughs> and, uh, well, I did. Uh, but now my sound is on finally here, I think. But... Um, they challenged me to intellectually examine it, and I thought that was the biggest joke ever, because I thought Christians had two brains. One was lost, and the other was out looking for it. Uh, I figured if a Christian had a brain, it would die of loneliness. And uh, so they made me so mad. Everything they did was appropriate. I was a problem. And uh, so I set out to write my first book, that huge thing out there that's just now been totally revised, 70% new, called Evidence of Man's Averted. I set out to write that against the Christian faith. And I ended up becoming a Christian. And now I've written 148 books on it, all documented. And that's the context for my examining the resurrection, because it was one of three or four things I knew. If any one of these three or four things I could refute, my case was won. And I could destroy these faculty and students at the university. And uh, <clears throat> so I set out one, left the university, I'd made a lot of money, started a painting company. <clears throat> as a student, traveled all through Europe, gathering the evidence to refute the resurrection, ended up becoming a believer. And uh, I want to share with you some of the results that I found. Now, the background of this is, nor if I have two sessions, the first one I do on the scriptures, can you trust them? Are they historically reliable and accurate? Then I talk about the resurrection. This morning I have one session, so it's going to be in a resurrection. But... I've concluded and I've documented, debated it all over the world that there's 10 times the evidence for the historical reliability in the New Testament than any 10 pieces of classical literature combined. But on the resurrection, it is either one of the greatest facts in history or one of the greatest fables ever foisted upon the minds of men and women. It's one of the two. There's no in-between. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul lays it out. And I've done 250-some debates in universities. And I would always lay this out. You want to refute me? You want to refute Christianity? All you have to do, very simple. Just refute the resurrection. It's all gone. It's all gone. It was always easy to say that because you know they couldn't do it. But I said, it's all gone. And Paul said this, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, listen to this, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. 